God. And I want to continue on this theme. The entire month of June, we're talking about Holy Ghost. Everybody say Holy Ghost. I want to remind us that the Holy Ghost is a person. He's not just a power or an anointing. He's not a dove. He's not water. He's not fire. Uh, although a lot of these illustrations are used of him to help us to understand who he is, but he is the third person of the Trinity. He is divine. He is God. He is a person, and God has given us the spirit of himself. This is why Jesus said, it is better that I go because I will send someone just like me. And what Jesus was saying is he will live inside of you. He will, he will reveal the things of God to you. He will, he is the connection of relationship to the father and to the son. And so some of you that, uh, some of you that did not receive, you know, last week, I, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to continue to press on. I want you to be, uh, continue to believe because as we're going to read here in the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, in, in just a moment here, I want you to know it is the will of God for God to fill you by his spirit. Can I, can I say it to you this way? God wants you to be filled with his spirit more than you want to be filled. He's not, he's not, he's not, he's not holding out on you. He's not punishing you. God wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit more than you want to be filled. And, and you know, I, I had some conversations about, you know, we've got a lot of new people in our church. And, and, you know, some people were a little bit, you know, overwhelmed. They weren't sure, you know, as, as to what was happening. You know, different people in, in the second service in particular, I, I really thought the service was over. I kind of just sat down praying for people. And then, you know, Kimberly just went to another level. I mean, another level. A lot of people have, had left by then. And, uh, and and so and so listen I, I don't want you to be I don't want you to be freaked out because the spirit of God is moving and people are are responding I said to the pastors maybe we need to explain some things about about the moving of the Holy Spirit and then sometimes how people can uh, can react but I don't want you to think we're bizarre or weird or we've gone off the we've gone off the rails because this is why we have pastors and elders to steward the move of God to steward the the things of God so that we grow healthy and strong in the Lord and so I want you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Ephesians chapter 5 and by the way I encourage you to ask questions Ask questions rather than say, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, and people are bizarre, and they're acting weird. And, no, no, ask questions so that you will gain knowledge. But I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody say, be filled. Be filled. Now, before I read the word, I am sure that all of us have heard the term to be under the influence. Usually it's a, it's a negative connotation that when someone gets arrested, usually on alcohol or even now drugs, you know, that, that they say, well, they were under the influence. And we consider that to be a negative connotation, but I actually want to give you a positive spin on what I want to talk to you about today because Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and he commanded them and he encouraged them to be filled not with uh, stimulus and alcohol, but to be filled with the Spirit. And so today as we're going to talk about being filled with the Spirit, I actually want to talk to you about being under the influence, not of some foreign substance, but of God, of the Holy Spirit himself. Everybody say influence. But as we're talking about being filled today, we're really talking about being under the influence. That's also a leadership word. John Maxwell says that leadership is influence, that you are influencing, leading people in a positive manner, in a positive way. And so as I'm using that, that word, that concept today, I want you to understand that it is in a positive light. So let's stand, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. By the way, I brought out one of my favorite Bibles. This Bible here is being held together by electrical tape. It is, um, it's, quite, it's quite old, but I love this Bible. It's not the pastor's poor. It's, uh, how, many, how many have some favorite Bibles, eh? Some favorite swords that you go to war with. And, and honestly, if your Bible is not held together by tape and glue, if it's not falling apart, you're not spiritual. I just want you to... <laughs> I'm only half joking. I'm telling you, if you don't have, if you don't have some Bibles that you have been to war with, and there's notes in it, and highlighters, and you know, my mother used to pack things in her Bible, and it just gets all disjointed, and and so, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna keep taping this thing up. Glory to God. And so, 
Here in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul begins to write to the church in Ephesus. And I'm actually going to start, um, you know, I started verse 11 and 9 a.m. Uh, I'm actually going to start, uh, oh man, all the Bible is so good. <laughs> um, well, let, let's start at verse 8. A.V., we're going to start at verse 8. I know I didn't give you this earlier. Verse 8, I don't know if you, if you guys can be ready to go there. Ephesians 5, he says, For you were once darkness. Is it up there? I threw them off a little bit. Give them grace. For you were once darkness. Not even that you were in the dark, you were dark. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. The light happens in the day. We know that the dark happens at the night. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And he says, and have no fellowship, no communion, no relationship, I'm on verse 11, with the unfruitful works of darkness. So now he's saying you were once darkness. Now he's saying you're children of the light. Don't have any communion. Don't have relationship or fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Don't, don't be their friends. Uh, don't, get a, don't get along with them. Uh, don't make excuses for them. Don't, don't accept them. Rather expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But you know, we're living in a day now it's not, a, it's not even in secret anymore. It is, it is bold, outrageous, in your face. As a matter of fact, the, the more arrogant they can be, they, they just seem to me more proud of it. He says, but all these things are exposed and are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. So when the light comes, the darkness gets exposed. Therefore, he says, awake. Turn to somebody say, wake up. He says, awake you who sleep. He's talking to Christians. He says, arise from the dead. Check somebody, see if they're dead right now. If they're dead, come on. And then he says, and Christ will give you light because you were darkness, but now you're in the light. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Here's what Paul is saying. Walk upright, walk straight. Don't, don't allow there to be crooked places disjointed places in your life. Upright, straight. Have your head on straight is really what he's talking about. Don't be foolish, but be wise. Why? He says, redeeming the time. That word means to buy back. Buy back the time because the days are evil. Now, if the days were evil in Paul's day, can you imagine the day that we are living in? We are living in some wicked, wicked days of things that are that are going on. And by the way, that people celebrate and call the, the new revelation, the new light. He says again, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. But Paul, what's the will of God? Well, he tells you in the very next verse, he says, and do not be drunk with wine. Everybody say, don't be drunk. Then he says, in which is dissipation, or another translation will say debauchery, or another translation says it'll ruin your life, but really, it's, it's really the word means to waste. You know what Paul is saying? Don't waste your life. Turn to somebody, tell them, say, don't waste your life. Prophesy that over yourself. Say, don't waste your life. By the way, you waste your life by wasting your time. Ooh, somebody ought to tweet that, man, I tell you. And then he says this, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Father, we love you, we bless you, and we thank you today. Lord, we thank you for your incredible presence that is here with us. May you continue to pour out your spirit. May you continue to fill us with fire and glory, with anointing. We thank you for the very substance of God, your very spirit. 
And all God's people said, amen. Turn to somebody before you're seated and say, be filled. Come on, be filled. Come on, be filled. Hallelujah. I want to say right off the bat that if you're not filled with God, you're going to be filled with something else. How many know people that are full of something? Huh? How many know people that are full of something, but it isn't God? Some of you are going to get that about three (laughs) o'clock. You know, you're full of something. It just ain't God. But God says, Paul says to us as he writes to the church in Ephesus that, that we're to be filled with the Spirit of God and that we are to continuously, continuously be filled with His Spirit and His anointing. And before I get to my, my points today, I, I want you to understand a little bit about the city of Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. By geography, that's where it would be. I don't know if some of you have have been there. You know, I was supposed to go on this uh, tour with Bishop before he passed away of all the all the like missionary places that uh, the Apostle Paul was, and we were supposed to go to Turkey to go see what uh, where Ephesus was. But in in the day that Paul is writing, I want you to understand the city that the gospel came into. Ephesus was a a metropolis. It was a, an economic booming city. It was a port city. Uh, it was a trade city. It'd be like your modern day New York, your modern day Milan, that in Paris, you know, Toronto. Uh, you know, can we add those kind of cities there? That kind of a city. It was a very spiritual city. They, they worshiped the goddess Diana there. Uh, they had uh, temple prostitutes. Can you imagine? You go to worship foreign gods and you can have a little something, something on the side. That's what was going on here. It was a very uh, mystic city. It was very spiritual. It was very demonic. You remember that in the book of Acts that, that Paul cast a fortune-telling spirit out of a girl. Do you remember that? That kept following them and saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. And, and then Paul got so irritated. He cast that demon out, which tells you that fortune-telling is demonic. Is demonic. Horoscopes are demonic. Palm readings and all crystal balls and all this stuff. You want to know your future? Why would you trust a demon to tell you the truth? Trust God. That's why we bring in the prophets. So the prophets will speak to you about the future of your life. And you don't have to go chasing these demons. Come on somebody. Help me out today. So Paul casts out this lying demon. Now, here's what's interesting. The lying demon was actually saying who they were, and then they got into trouble. That This is the very city. It was, it was a city that, you know, Brother Hero, if you had a competitor and you thought he was doing better than you, you would hire somebody to put a curse on that person. Then they would hire somebody to get protection from the curse that you put on them. And, and all this demonic, spiritualistic stuff was happening in a very religious city. Get the picture? Very religious city. So it's spiritual. It's booming. People are doing well. And all of a sudden, the gospel comes into this place. Sounds like today. And Paul begins to write to these Christians. And he says, listen, don't be foolish. Be wise, redeem the time, understand the environment that you are in and understand the way you ought to live because the days are evil. And he says, you know, redeem the times, be able to discern. You know, when when Prophetess Nancy was here, she kept using this scripture with me. I don't know if she said it publicly or if it was more in our private meetings, but but there's a book, you know, or, or there's a scripture in the book of Proverbs that says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy the truth. What does that mean? How do I buy the truth? How do I buy the truth? Because the truth is costly. Have you ever noticed lies are cheap? They're a dime a dozen, but the truth is costly. And so when you buy the truth, don't sell it out. So many of God's people, so many churches, so many ministries are selling out God. They're selling out the Bible. They're selling out principles. They are selling the truth for popularity. Yes or yes? And so Paul says, redeem the times. Don't be foolish, but be filled. And, and so in the, in the midst of describing, you know, the, the way that they ought to live 
And by the way, here's what he's saying. The very launch pad of the way that you ought to live, believers, he says, is you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Bishop Tony Miller would say it this way, that, that being filled with Holy Spirit is the radical, minimal level of Christianity. That, In other words, you launch from there. There's no other way. But to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be filled with Holy Spirit. Everybody say, Holy Spirit. The name, the name, the description itself tells you a little bit about him. What kind of a spirit is he? He's holy. He's pure. He's godly because he is God. And so Paul says to them, this is the way you ought to behave. This is, this is the way you ought to live. This is the radical minimal level because, because my friends, nowhere in the New Testament will you ever find anybody asking the question, is this a spirit-filled church? They were all spirit-filled. You didn't go anywhere without them being filled. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, and I've encouraged you every day, every day, read a chapter of the book of Acts. You, you remember that people were getting saved and then Peter and John would come along to saved people and say, have you received the Holy Ghost? And some of them said, we don't, we don't even know that there is a Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that they would lay hands on them and they would be filled with the Spirit of God. You cannot live, listen to me, and we could go to that slide. You cannot live a normal Christian life unless you are filled with the Spirit. I want to lay these principles. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate your encouragement. I want you to understand. Look at my right. This will be my right. The Spirit-filled life is a normal Christian life. But we live in a day, is it okay if I take my jacket off? You know, my... My mother would always say to me, don't take off your, I could hear her from heaven saying, put your jacket on, put your jacket on. You know, if I have sweaty pits, forgive me, but um, it's just really hot up here. You know, maybe I should have just worn white, but listen, the, the spirit filled life is a normal life, but we live in a day where everything that is weird is normal and everything that is normal is weird. Paul's saying, you're not weird. This is normal. Uh, in the book of Acts, where we read last week in chapter 2, where, where you know people marveled at what was going on, but there's always going to be the mockers. What did they say? These people are drunk. Peter said, they're not drunk. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, I know people that drink at 9 o'clock in the morning. But Peter said, they're not drunk. They're full of the Spirit. But watch this. Whatever their intoxication was, whatever their, their being under the influence of the Spirit, they, they lost control in some sense that, that, my friends, watch this. They looked like they were drunk, but they weren't drunk. It's the normal life. The Spirit-filled life is the normal life. We're not weird. You know that egg commercial? You know the egg commercial that says, eggs, uh, eggs for dinner? And then they go, you're weird. The guy goes, no, you're, she goes, you're weird. Look at your pants, right? <laughs> We're not weird. They're weird. We're not weird. If you're not spirit filled, you're weird. Sure? We're normal. <laughs> we are normal. Everybody say, We're normal. <laughs> Second principle that I, that I want you to see there is that as I, I, put, I wanted to put the word raise, but really, I want us to think about like filling a tank. That when we, when we fill the tank, when we are filled by the Spirit of God, our standards of living automatically will rise. Amen. Church, you don't even have to work at Honestly, if you just get filled with God, your, your, your emotions change, your thinking change, your behavior changes, your, your locations change, your relationships change, your language changes. Our standards just rise they're not depleted, but we're living in a day of depleted standards, even by God's people that are, they're, they're drinking the Kool-Aid of the world and saying, you know what, well, that's okay, and yeah, that's okay, and you know, you know that, there's, a little bit of, there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but you know what, for the most part, it's okay. You know, oh, that song is really wicked, but boy, is it catchy. Well, who cares? Who cares? It's, it's the lyrics that matter, right? And then the third point, here's the third principle, as I, I'm going to bring you into the points right now, but I, I want you to notice something about what John the Baptist said. When he saw Jesus, he said, he must increase and I must decrease. In, in other words, church, that when Jesus comes into your life, he takes over. He moves in. He rearranges the furniture. 
like he thinks he's in charge because he has this idea that he bought you and that if he bought you, he owns you. And how many know that if you own something, you can do whatever you want with it? Huh? Because you bought it. And so God says, I'm moving in and I'm, and I'm evicting some things and I'm moving the, I'm moving the furniture. But, but watch this. A lot of times as God's people, we are focused on the emptiness. We are focused on the, oh, I better decrease this. I better decrease that. I better change this and I better change that. Can, can, can I just change your mindset a little bit? Instead of focusing on what's empty, why don't you just focus on getting full of God? Fill your life with the Spirit of God. That if there's emptiness, there's brokenness, there's wants and desires. I said in the earlier service, you know, I've talked to different people that are, are single and and you know, honestly, my heart goes out. My heart goes out because there are pressures and challenges, especially in our world today, especially in the area of sexuality. And I've had these conversations with women even. And, and I ask them, what do you do? What do you do? And they say, pastor, we just get full of God. We replace the emptiness with God. God, God fills that area of our life so it doesn't become all consuming. If you are being consumed by something to the place of torment, then allow God to fill you so that he will increase and you will decrease. We call that grit. Oh, somebody give God praise. We call that grace. Fill me, God. Fill, fill the emptiness, the loneliness, the rejection, whatever it may be. All right, here are my points. What do people look like? How do they behave? People that are under the influence. What does it look like? Number one, here's what I want you to understand. People that are under the influence and are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God takes them from chaos into order. Everybody say order. In the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and, and those of you that are Bible students, I, I want you to look up the word that the Spirit of God hovered that the Spirit of God brooded over the earth, over the, over the void, over the darkness, that when Holy Spirit comes into our lives and He fills us, the very thing He does at the very beginning is He evicts chaos. He evicts dysfunctionality. He, he evicts the things that are not in order. That's why when you come to God for the first time in your life, you think straight. For the first time in your life, your, your thoughts are right. You're like, wow, I got clarity. I'm thinking right. I'm thinking straight. Because God in Holy Spirit is responsible to bring you into his order. Now, here's what's interesting. The world has an order that is different than God's order. That's why when you say, I'm in my right mind, they think you're out of your mind. They say things like, well, you've been brainwashed. It's like, yeah, all my brain's been washed. You're absolutely right. Because your brain is in darkness. Your, your thoughts are just constantly evil and constantly wicked all the time. Everybody say order. And so our, the action out of, out of this first point is that, number one, we go forward every day. Since I've received that prophetic word, you know, every day I just say, Lord, I make a commitment to go forward. I make a, I make a commitment today to progress. I, I want to focus on what's ahead of me. I want to forget the things that are behind me, the things that are trying to distract me and sidetrack me, the, the things that are trying to cause dysfunctionality within my life and in my relationships. I just want to go forward. Church, get away from people that are dysfunctional. Get away from people that cause drama. Huh? They have got a degree in drama. Get away from those people. Honestly, because they create disorder. They create issues and fighting, and Holy Spirit is there to bring peace into your life, into your home, to bring order. Number two, number two, he talks about potential. That when we are filled with the Spirit, our potential is not wasted. You see what he said? He said, with wine, there is dissipation. In other words, it wears off. 
People that are addicted, people that are alcoholics, what do, have, what do they have to do? When the buzz wears off, you have to repeat. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. You know, some people literally live, live a life to party. They, they work all week so they, they can blow all their money on the weekend, get smashed, get hammered. They got their head in a toilet. They don't know what happened and what they did. They're baffoons on social media. And then they go, oh, wasn't that a great time? I don't remember what happened, but all was amazing. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Why? Because alcohol, you know what Paul is saying, is not only a stimulator, it's an antidepressant. Remember COVID, anybody? Do you remember what the government said to you during COVID? They said to you that the LCBO was essential and the church wasn't. Huh? See, because they're smart enough to figure out that if we lock these people up and they're not sedated, we're going to have a problem. And what do you get at the LCBO? Spirits. Am I talking to anybody? See, what they're saying to you is, these are the spirits you need to keep you sedated so that we can manipulate and control you. Too much truth? Because, oh, well, pastor, well, don't you know they care about us, do they? Let me tell you what they care about. I'm driving in, and I'm glad I'm online, bless Jesus. I'm driving in. I see this big sign over here in the plaza that the cannabis store is now open till 11 p.m. Can you imagine if I said the church was open till 11 p.m.? They'd probably say, you know, there's a bylaw against that. Don't go to, don't go to church. And, 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 and by the way, even at that time, they were saying, and if you go to church, you know, nobody should sing because you're going to get COVID. But there's no COVID in the LCBO. Paul said, don't waste your time. And don't waste your life. And, and so what's the antidepressant? Why do people drink? Why, why, why are people doing marijuana now? I, I, you know, I, I went for a bike ride yesterday. I thought I was going to get high just going through this one path. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even have to buy the stuff. I can just be in the vicinity. <laughs> Why are people doing these things? Because they're painkillers. Because they suppress memories and issues and problems and, and people drink to forget and to depress. You know what God says? I'll give you my spirit so you don't need that kind of a painkiller so that you'll be delivered and set free. And some of us, church, I'm just gonna, can I be bold today? Some of us come from cultures that pride ourselves on the amount of liquor that we can hold. Come on, somebody. Which says to me, so you can't, you can't talk about this stuff because then you're racist. But let me tell you the truth. The truth is that there are propensities and dispositions within some cultures that are not in others. And if you come from that culture, you have to be aware of that. So that you just go, oh, you know, our people, our people, we just drink. What does that even mean? Do, do you know that when you come to Christ, you have no people? You've, you've died. You're part of a new kingdom. You're, you're part of a new order. Huh? The only bar you should be going to is the bar of the Holy Ghost. Because alcohol does things to people. Now, now church, I, I want to be clear. Not every drunk is a happy drunk, okay? It's like some people that get drunk are mean and nasty, but other, at least I have relatives of mine that I'm like, you know what, you need a drink. <laughs> Truth. 
truth. I'm not going to give you a beer myself because you're happier when you drink. Now watch, watch, what, watch the contrast. I want you to notice what wine does to some people. That Pastor Moses, when, when people begin to drink, you know what happens to some people? They actually get more generous. They, they, they go like this. Oh, I want to buy everybody a drink. You know what Pastor Moses talks to you about giving? You know what he's telling you? Get drunk in God. Because drunk people are generous people. Come on now. How many, have, how many have noticed that when some people are drunk, they actually think they're stronger than they really are? Huh? They want to fight everybody. And usually, they don't feel anything. How many have found that as you get drunk, your speech begins to slur? But you see, when you're drunk in the Holy Ghost, God cleans your speech up. Some people that get drunk, they're, they're more fun, they're more friendly, they're actually more pleasant to be around. See, a Holy Ghost is what Paul's saying to you. When, when you get full with the Holy Ghost, you're going to be generous. Your speech is going to be cleared up. You're, you're actually going to be friendly and warmer, and, and you're actually going to be a person that other people want to be around. If you've ever been stopped or if you've ever watched somebody be stopped, how many know that drunk people don't walk straight? But see, people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, they walk straight. That's what Paul's saying. Don't, don't let this substance, you don't need it to kill the pain. The Holy Ghost will take care of it for you. Number three, those that are under the authority of God, submit to the will of God. In, in, in other words, they understand that God rules over them. Let's change the slide, please. That God has authority, that, that the Lord rules your life, that, that the Lord is involved in the decisions that you and I make. This is why James says, you know, James says, don't say we're going to do this and we're going to go here and we're going to do that. He said, that kind of talk is evil. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wills. Amen. If it's the Lord's will. We'll buy the house, we'll sell the house, we'll, we'll move here, we'll go to that church, we'll go to that school, if it's the Lord's will. It is phenomenal to me how many people make decisions and they never even ask God, is this your will? Should I marry this person? Is this your will? God, are you interested in my future? Is this the path that I should take? Young people, I want to encourage you. The will of God is the best place for you to be. Yes. I've always been, go ahead, Corey. You know, uh, I, might, I told you I might be going to Indonesia on a, on a missions trip and people say to me, oh, do you know how dangerous some of these countries are? See, my friends, I'm not so much concerned about how dangerous the countries are. I'm more concerned about how dangerous it is to be out of the will of God. Amen. See, if I'm supposed to be in Indonesia and I don't go, but I'm here, how many understand I'm in more danger here than I would be over there? Amen. But people have this idea, well, God's just me. He nasty. He don't, you know, God doesn't want you to have any fun. You know, God doesn't want you to have a good time. He doesn't want you to enjoy life. Of course he does. The will of God is the best place, church. And can I help some of you? If, if Father says no to you, that means he loves you. And that he has something better for you. I have, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I have refused. See, I said to Pastor Moses and Pastor Jason and Pastor Alicia, I don't care what the circumstances are, I will never refuse dedicating a baby. Born out of wedlock, I don't care. I will never refuse dedicating a baby, but I have refused to marry people. 
Because what I know, this is not good. This is not the will of God. This is, this is going to end badly. I've said, I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend you. They're always offended. I don't mean to offend you. Or I'm not marrying you. And they get angry, Jonathan. They come back. You know, they never come back and apologize and say, you know, Pastor, you were right. I actually saw it true. I had one person recently said to me, you were right. I should have said, now go buy me a coffee. <laughs> you, you, you say no to people because you love them. John, aren't you glad I married you? Bless God, eh? You're happy now, aren't you? Yeah. Because the will of God, the happier than like, they're just happy. <laughs> All right? God's authority, God's rule, God's ownership of you. Number four. Number four. Can I, can, I, can I go back to number two just for a minute? Let me go back to no, not wasting and potential. I, I want to take you to the book of Acts for a moment where, where there was a problem with the widows and the widows weren't, weren't being fed. And, and so they went to Peter and said, you know, Peter, the widows aren't being fed and, and, and the system doesn't work. And so, you know, Peter said, listen, we got we to be focused on prayer and the word. We can't bust tables. He said, get seven men. Listen, watch this. Get seven men, maybe the first deacons that watch the criteria. They have a good reputation inside and outside the church. They're full of wisdom. They're full of faith and they're full of the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine? Peter says, if, if we're going to take care of the widows and we're going to bust tables, we need people that are full of the Holy Ghost. Huh? I thought about this. I was saying this earlier. I said to Candace, you know, our parent, I said, I said, Lord, I said, all our staff are spiritual people, prophesying people, filled with the Holy Ghost. My friends, listen, you need a demon cast out of you. You don't need to come to the pastor. Go to the staff. Then get that demon out of you before you get to my office. <laughs> that ought to be our new criteria. Hey, we ought to ask that question. Can you cast out a demon? Because if you can't, you can't work here. There was a, there's a pastor in Africa. Oh man, I'm blanking out. You want to be an elder in his church? You have to raise the dead. If you haven't risen the dead, you're not an elder. That's their criteria. Can you raise the dead? No, you're not here. <laughs> Number four, awareness. Everybody say awareness. Living, living in the awe. Living in the awe. See, we have awareness for an hour, an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, and then we go on with life. But, but church, are you aware of Holy Ghost all the time? Are, are, are you aware of the Holy Ghost in your home, in your, in your car? Are you aware of the Holy Ghost in the workplace, in, in the place that you commune? I, uh, you know, this week, I think it was, I can't remember the exact day, I, uh, I'd, I'd gone golfing and I was left all alone. All alone, so people couldn't make it. I, I had to play the back nine, which is a weird kind of thing to do to play golf with yourself. You usually play with four other people or three other people. And, and, um, and I'm on the back nine, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm here, Lord. I said, Lord, it's you and me. You and me, back nine. We, me and the Holy Ghost, we just, oh, I had an amazing time. I said, can you just straighten out that ball just a little bit? Just... <laughs> I believe the movie, if I'm wrong, you can correct me. I believe the movie, The, the Chariots of Fire. Anybody ever see that movie? Uh, it was a fantastic movie. And I believe it's this movie, but they had interviewed the individual. It was about marathon running. And <laughs> so, so, so they said to him, well, why do you run? Why do you run? You know what he said? When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. Yesterday I went out for a bike ride. I, I felt God's presence. I was like, God. I said, when I'm out here with you, I just, I just feel your presence. I'm aware. You know, Andrew, you work at the airport, right? You work for Air Canada now, and you're fixing planes, and 
close or getting parts. Yeah, you better be praying, bro. Keep those planes up in the air, right? But, but when, when, when some of you, you, you fix things, some of you are accountants, some of you are real estate agents, or are you aware of the presence of God? You know, Pastor Alicia, does that sound good? Pastor Alicia, can cameras follow me over here? Mikey, you know, she's, she's a social worker. Uh, she's involved with the police and the city. Uh, she's involved in this huge uh, project now with human trafficking and sexuality that, that they've invited her to be a part of. And, 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 and I've said, you know, I am sure you must sense the awareness of God in these places. In the book of Acts, I got one more point, we're done. In the book of Acts, anybody remember Ananias and Sapphira, this husband and wife? They lied to the Holy Ghost. And church, let me tell you, it's unhealthy to lie to the Holy Ghost. It's bad for your health. And, and husband and wife, because the Bible says that people were selling land and being very generous and they were bringing it at the apostles' feet and so it'd be like, wow, Red Jean brought 50,000 today. Everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. And oh, Andrew brought 30,000 today. And oh, Keith brought 10. And so everybody's like, you know, just rejoicing because the giving was public. And this husband and wife said, you know, we got to get a piece of this action. The notoriety, the the, wow, look how generous we are. But the Bible says they had a piece of land and they sold it for a certain amount of money. But watch what they conspired. They said, we're going to tell that idiot Peter that we sold the land for this much and we're going to keep the rest. And they come in in front of everybody and say, hey, we sold this land and here's the money, Peter. And the Holy Ghost said, Money's missing. That's not the price, Peter. They sold the land, but they've kept the money. And so Peter says, when you sold the land, was it not your land? Yes, it was. And when you sold the land and you had the money, was it not your money? So far, they're okay. Sold the land, brought the money. But Peter says this, you haven't lied to people. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. For your stature, for your fame, for your notoriety, so that people will applaud you. In other words, you know what they were? They were fakers. They wanted to appear. As some, and God would have been okay if they'd have come and said, hey, look, we're going to give you 50%. God would have said, cool. It's okay. We received that, whatever that amount was. But you see, they had this attitude, no awareness of the Holy Spirit because they were just going to lie to the leader, lie to the pastor. He's an idiot. He's a buffoon. He doesn't know what's going on anywhere. But you see, the Holy Ghost knows everything. So he says, yep, that's the price. Boom, he dies. Then the wife comes in. Same story. They had a ministry Listen, their ushers did a different type of job. Their ushers didn't take out the offering, they took out the bodies. <laughs> Peter said, is this, it, you know, Sapphira, is this the, oh yeah, that's the story. What did he say? He says, the very feet that took your husband out are waiting at the door. See, my friends, if God, if God were to operate like that today, first of all, we'd have less attendance. <laughs> But nobody would want to come to the church because they'd be like, oh, you don't want to go to that church. God kills people in that church. <laughs> but you know what the Bible says? And the church grew. You know why? The people that were serious, the people that wanted to be filled, the people that wanted to be honest and open before God and be an open book and not be faker said, I want to be there because God moves there. Everybody say awareness. Be aware, church. Be aware. And I don't know why I need to say this, but I'm going to say it. A little white lie is a lie. Huh? Why don't they call it little black lies? I don't know. Huh? We ought to change that, Jay. I, I think we ought, to, we ought to, everything else being changed, right? But... But isn't it amazing how we justify certain behaviors? Why? Because we're not filled. Last point, we're done. We get to go home. 
Number five, atmospheres of power that... And I'm going to close my Bible so that you're convinced <laughs> that when we are filled, we change the atmosphere. Isn't that what we sing? Isn't that what we sang this morning? Worship team, you could come up that, that we say to God, God, we want you to change the atmosphere. We, we, want, you to, we want you to fill the room. I'm going to keep this, Jay. I know you're coming. We want, we want you to fill the room, but, but, but church, do you, do you get up on a Monday morning, John? Do you get up on a Monday morning, you go to work and say, God, fill this truck, fill this, fill this office, fill this people, fill my neighborhood. Those of you that are nurses, Tamara, where's Tamara? Tamara, you're, you're an awesome nurse. You ever, you ever go into that hospital and say, God, fill this hospital with your presence today. Touch the hurting, the dying, the ones that are afraid. Fill, fill. You having a problem with your young people? Go into their room. It's your house. It's your house. I say that to my, to my family, to my children all the time. My house. You just happen to sleep in this room, my house. Huh? My daughter, I gotta be careful because I'm online here. Her, her room was so messy, not, not the one that's here, all right? So we're gonna cut, we're gonna, we're gonna edit this out, bless God. But I would say to her, your room is so messy. I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna rip off the door so that everybody can see the mess. My house, my rules. Come on, somebody, get into those rooms and begin to pray that the atmosphere begin to change in your house. I had to say to my own, my own flesh and blood, my own daughter at a time in her life, I said, if you're going to live this way, you're not going to live in this house. We have standards here. My daughter, we're, you know, we're building relationship. She's on her way back to the Lord and God's doing amazing things. But I saw my daughter, listen, I saw my daughter leave my house with garbage bags, all her stuff in garbage bags because I hate my daughter, because I love my daughter. Listen to me, parents. Part of the problem with our day is that we do not allow consequences to play themselves out. Draw the line. Draw the line. You know, you guys are going to have a baby. My God, you're just getting chubbier every week. Praise Jesus. But <laughs> decide now. Adult. Mikhail, decide now. These are the lines. These are the boundaries. We love our children. This is how you will grow. This is how you will behave. Everybody say atmosphere. Okay, last thing. And I had to look at my, I had to look at my note. And then we're done. I promise you, I'm not Pastor Moses. I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> I love those pants, by the way, you know. When they don't go to the bottom, do you get a discount? I'm just wondering. I just, I just figure you're, you're losing, you, you know, you don't got as much material. I would ask, you know, I, I'm just going to leave that there. I'm not even going to look at him. All right. We're almost done. We're almost done. All right. Everybody stand so you know we're almost done. <laughs> you can go get your sweaters. If I went to school like that, I'd get punched out. I just want you to know. Right, Joel? <laughs> Buy the truth and do not sell it. <laughs> How many love Pastor Moses? Come on. This is, though every Greek word and I've got a Greek scholar here. Every Greek word has three parts to it. It has a mood, it has a tense, and it has a voice. The word filled, number one, is in an imperative mood. You know what it means? It's a command. Paul's saying, I am commanding you. Not I'm suggesting, not it would be a good idea. I really want to encourage you. No, no, no. You know what Paul said? I am commanding you to be filled. It is a command. Everybody say command. Number two, it's in the present tense. So here's what he's saying. Be filled. I got filled. Be filled. Tomorrow, be filled. Next week, be filled. 2027, be filled. It is, it is constantly in the present tense until the Lord returns. It's not I was filled. He says be filled. It's a command. 
It's in the present tense. Watch this. It's in the passive voice. Pastor, what does that mean? The passive voice means you can't do it. God's saying, I'll do it for you. If you will just be open, if you will believe and receive, I will fill you. It's a command. It's continuous. And then God says, you need me to do it for you. Stop twisting yourself like a pretzel. It's God's will to fill you. Everybody raise your hands. What are we going to sing, Christina, Joel, Reggie, what are we going to sing? I love, oh, I love your presence. Father, in the name of Jesus today, we truly love your presence, Holy Spirit. We adore you. We celebrate you. Fill us, fill us, fill us. Even to overflow, let our cup run over. Lord, that we may bless others, that we may be a blessing, that, that everywhere we go, people can say, God is here. Baptize us in your spirit. Baptize us in fire. Encourage us, Lord, and fill the empty places. Fill the places of pain and anguish, of loneliness and rejection. And heal us, God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.